Um, yeah, starting now. OK, yeah. um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. This is Council Leader Dave Stewart here, and I'm commencing the meeting of the Isle of Wight Local Outbreak Engagement Board on Thursday, the 14th of January 2021. Um, this is a virtual meeting due to the current COVID situation um, and the usual rules uh, and directions apply. Item one is the minutes from the previous meeting, which are in the papers at page five to ten. And I would ask the uh, board members if they would be uh, happy to confirm these as a true record of the minutes of the meeting, which were held on the on which was held on the 10th of December 2020. Are members happy with that? Yep. Yes. Confirm. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item two. Um, can I invite any members who are on this uh, meeting? to declare if they have any interest that they might have in relation to matters on the agenda, which they have not already declared. Are there any? No, none, not from me. Thank you for that. Um, item three is public question time. Now, I understand um, that we have a question from a member of the public and I'll ask the chief executive if he would read the question out um, that I have and then I will read the response. And that's question one, which came in from uh, a local resident. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. It, it is a it is a very long question. It's from Sam McLucky, who's a, an SEN teacher from Cows. So I'd propose to paraphrase. Um, thank you. So the question is, uh, would uh, would the local authority, DFA, and government publish the evidence that suggests SEN teaching staff are at less risk than their mainstream counterparts? and which eliminates their legal requirements to provide safe working conditions. Uh, over to you, Chairman. Thank you. I, I think having heard the first topic you've raised, I should make clear that my, a member of my family is a special education will need support assistance. So um, I therefore answer with that in mind. Thank you. Um, so the answer to the question is that through the, throughout the pandemic, the Isle of Wight Council has carefully followed the advice circulated by the Department for Education. This has been informed by Public Health England and therefore contains the advice both schools and the local authority should follow. Mainstream primary and secondary schools are technically closed, but with the requirement that all vulnerable children and children of critical workers are able to access full time education provision on site face to face. Proportions of vulnerable children and children of critical workers vary from school to school. Special schools and alternative provision, such as the Island Learning Centre, are required to remain open. All children in special schools have an East HCP, an educational health and care plan, and are therefore within the vulnerable category. Hence, all children and young people in special schools may have access to full time face to face provision. The position regarding all children attending special schools and how that is reconciled with the need to reduce attendance and social mixing has been clarified by the Department of Education. The intention when making the decision to close schools was to reduce overall social contact across the education system, geographical areas and the country rather than individually by institution. This means that the DFE can meet its desire to reduce household mixing overall by closing schools to all but the children of critical workers and vulnerable children, whilst ensuring the latter continue to have access to high quality education in school. The DFE continues to assert that the schools are safe and that reducing numbers are not a direct safety measure, but a means of reducing social mixing. And I hope that will be sufficient for the needs of the questioner and I'd like to thank the questioner for the question. Thank you. You're on mute, John. Thank you, Leader. Uh, and just to confirm uh, the question and answer will be sent back to the question after the meeting. <coughs> Leader, okay. uh, the second question is from uh, Dominic Coughlin, uh, National Education Union. Uh, it reads, uh, given that the test centre on the island is a drive-in centre and only accessible to those with access to a car, would you confirm the total number of postal tests requested by island residents, the total <coughs> successfully returned for testing and the number of positive cases resulting from postal tests since September? 
Leader, um, I can advise that we do not hold this data. The data is held by the Department for Health and Social Security. We have approached them and asked if they could help us provide an answer to Mr Coffin's question. They, they did uh, respond in the affirmative, but we've not yet received anything back from them. Uh, if anything does come back, then we will uh, make it available to Mr Coughlin and also to members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I thank Mr Coughlin for his question and I hope he gets the answer that he, he wants. Thank you for that. Um, I don't think there are any other public questions, so I'll move to item four, which um, is the reports from the local outbreak engagement board. Um, and these form three elements. Firstly, an update on the current situation here on the island, um, which will include public health data. Secondly, the action taken and required, um, which will be covered by the Director of Public Health, who I see is with us. And then thirdly, an update on the communication activity that we're continuing on the island. And I think the Assistant Chief Executive um, and Strategy Officer will deal with that. So. Um, Simon, if I could pass over to you, and you are on mute at the moment. Many thanks, uh, Leader. Uh, with your permission, can I share a presentation to talk through the data? Would that be OK? That would be very helpful, and I hope everybody that's on the call can read it. Do let me know if um, that is visible. Visible. Can I just confirm yeah. the screen says I'm on mute, but I don't think I am. Can people hear me as well? Yes, yeah, I can. We can hear you and the presentation's visible. Many thanks. Uh, so this report, uh, as just for confirmation, the data does change on a regular basis. So as the data gets updated, um, we've updated the presentation, but obviously do, things do change uh, and new data comes through the day. So this is the latest data as of this morning, which I'll be sharing with the board around the situation of COVID on the Isle of Wight. Uh, my presentation does include some of the actions, so uh, leader will pause after the data and then move on to the second part after that. Thank you. Really like to start with a map of where we are across the country, just to put that in context so we can see in week 52, uh, the week just prior to Christmas, uh, the spread and the higher rates being the darker red areas. And then we move to week 53, we can see that dramatic change and increase of rates across the whole country. Bear in mind, uh, from the southeast is where we saw uh, rather a large increase and that was moving west and north and I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, why that is coming forward. Uh, so when we look at this map across the southeast we can see all areas of the southeast of England and beginning in the southwest and moving up uh, have a rate of over 400 per 100,000. Uh, that's obviously very concerning uh, and you'll see what I'm going to do through this presentation, start national and come local. So we'll look at what that means for the Isle of Wight uh, in due course, but we can see across Hampshire, Southampton, Isle of Wight, across all areas that our rates are high. And then when we look at our more local area, we can see that the Isle of Wight has a rate of 1,171 per 100,000, uh, and that has dramatically gone up, uh, although that is stabilising a little bit, the rate of increase is slowing down. And we can see again across the whole of our local area, the rates there. Uh, and they're, they're all uh, moving in a similar direction. So despite some being lower, uh, there is an increase in rates. When we look at our uh, rates across, as someone's kind of called it, ceremonial Hampshire, so the four uh, upper tier authorities uh, in our local resilience forum area, so Southampton, Portsmouth, Isle of Wight and Hampshire, we can see across the pandemic, the rates uh, across the, the whole of the pandemic where we are uh, with regard to coronavirus and the Isle of Wight here, still has a lower rate uh, per 100,000, although increasing rapidly, but we are still in a positive position overall. And then when we look at the epidemic uh, progressing over time on the Isle of Wight, again, comparing with our seven day rates uh, around uh, the region, uh, we can see that uh, the first wave here was uh, quite small in comparison to where we are now on the right hand side of the graph with our increase Cases and I think it's just worth saying it with the uh, there is an indicating rise in spread, but it seems to be slowing down slightly, which is really positive. Again, you can see the seven day rates for England, South East London, Hampshire, Southampton, Port and the Isle of Wight and uh, the total number of cases across the pandemic for the Isle of Wight. And then our trending cases again just puts it in a slightly different 
way we can see uh, the increase in uh, cases more recently. Uh, pillar one are the tests done in the hospital, and you can see that huge increase in pillar two cases, those done in community. Uh, also worth bearing in mind, back before September, we didn't have pillar two. Uh, this is uh, this slight downtick here is due to uh, the data being validated. So we need to take a considered look at this last point here. And then when we look at over 60s rates, uh, we can see again that does mirror but is the rate is lower than all age rate, which is really positive. And we keep a really close eye on that because the over 60s rates are those that are going to be more likely to be ill, uh, seriously ill and end up in hospital. So we want to keep an eye on that. And that mirrors um, our spread generally, uh, but is lower, which is um, good. But we know we need to be concerned about that. When we do look at our age band, so this is across the Isle of Wight. Uh, we can see this um, tartan rug table shows the rates of hospital, uh, sorry, pardon me, rates of infection across all age bands with the uh, 85 plus being particularly dark purple, so a high rate there, and also our rate in our working age population. So just to kind of be mindful that those populations are more likely to catch COVID uh, and then sub subsequently, as we just talked about, the, that older group will be uh, more likely to suffer the uh, poor consequences of COVID. So trends in COVID and our healthcare activity. This data is not updated as much as other data. What, what it's worth looking at rather than looking at the actual figures is the trend. So we know it's going up. Uh, and again, uh, with ventilator beds, uh, we know that the uh, numbers are smaller, so they fluctuate. But we know we've seen a huge increase since uh, the beginning of October, not yet, well, you can see small numbers, but an increase in numbers of cases uh, across um, our system in terms of people requiring mechanical ventilation for COVID. Uh, so a concerning picture, but we are working well with the hospital. It's a busy position and we want to protect uh, our population and our hospitals. And nationally, that's why we've seen a lot of that work going on around uh, lockdown, because we saw an increase in patients across the country requiring urgent action to be taken. When looking at the tier monitoring, so uh, despite the fact we're not in tiers now, which were the tiers of intervention one to four, we're in the lockdown, uh, it's worth looking at those figures because that's the way that the government looks at our figures. So we know that uh, our all age rate is 1,171 and our over 60s rate is 802. Our rate is slowing and our positivity is 18.1. So that has decreased slightly, but still shows we're at the height of the epidemic um, and our hospital remains under pressure. I wanted to share this graph with the board today around the new variants, um, the SARS-CoV variants. So just to be mindful, uh, we can see here the southeast table uh, chart there showing that increase of the blue line showing the new variant and how that's spreading across southeast. And then when you look at where we are, uh, the Isle of Wight is um, the four, fourth bar in. So from the work we're doing, and this is just pillar two testing, around 97%, 96 to 7% are caused by the new variant. It has increased transmittability, but it doesn't have, at this point, it doesn't uh, have increased disease severity. Remember, it's quite a new variant. We're also looking at the South African variant, which has a higher viral load, which means it um, may impact on the body uh, and give more worse outcomes. That's a very new variant and we're doing a lot of work to prevent that coming into the country. Uh, the graphs are around the um, the uh, variant, which is the um, what's technically called the S drop um, variant. But you'll be familiar with that because it started in Kent. Uh, Leader, I'll stop there before I go into my update of key actions taken. Thank you. I'll just go around the board, see if anybody's got any questions. Uh, Councillor Hutchinson. Uh, th thank you, Leader. Um, clearly, we're all incredibly concerned about the huge spikes that we've seen here on the island. Um, and I, I know we have previously speculated as to what might have caused the very rapid change that you've just shown us uh, from when we were in tier one. Uh, and, and I know that we have looked at a number 
issues that might have caused it, like like uh, commuter density on ferries, um, the fact that in tier one everybody was perhaps more relaxed than they should have been because they felt safer uh, and therefore um, they were mixing more. Um, we've speculated about whether it's students returning from other higher infected areas to here. People have said, well, is it second homeowners? Um, and I've even heard it said it, it's visitors, although in fact, uh, during the summer when we had a lot of visitors, there wasn't an increase uh, that were correlated to that. So I, I don't know whether we are yet in a position to have any information as to the likely cause of that very sudden increase. And I will entirely understand if it's not something we are able to measure. So if I just respond uh, to that question, Kelly Hutchinson. So we know this virus thrives on people mixing and people getting together. So we know that the more relaxed people are about those behaviours around social distancing, hand hygiene and wearing a face covering, that the virus is more likely to spread. This new variant spreads 70% faster. So uh, sorry, it's 70% more transmittable. So actually it's much easier to spread. So with anything, if, if any lapse in those two metres in that wearing a face covering, it's much more likely to spread. And uh, we were testing students around the country before they came home, if they came home to live on the Isle of Wight. But and also we know that we have people who travel back and forwards from the island to the mainland, to the mainland to the island for work. So that is increasing that that spread because the more people that move around, the more likely this particularly this new variant is spreading. So uh, I guess the message is we need to make sure we're doing all we can to prevent spread. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Peace, did you have any questions? Uh, no questions, um, uh, Chair, but it might be worth, uh, or it might be useful pointing out at this point in time where, where we're talking about um, behaviour in general, is that as a council, uh, our environmental health teams in conjunction with local police have issued our first fixed penalty notices against a business, a GM in ride. Um, the two individuals have been issued with uh, fixed penalty notices of £1,000 each. And in conjunction with that also, um, the uh, members of the gym that were present have also been issued by with fixed penalty notices by police. So, uh, and that is, uh, it comes back to behaviour. It's people not doing what they were supposed to be doing. And it's down to the gym not acting in accordance with uh, local lockdown procedures, um, but we'll have uh, we'll have further information on that later. OK, that's excellent. Thank you very much. And I think it's a good example of the fact that the Isle of Wight police um, are doing uh, and are willing to um, issue notices required and it should serve as a warning to those people that you shouldn't break the rules that have been set up to protect everybody. Uh, Councillor Mosdell, did you have anything you wanted to uh, ask of our Director of Health? Uh, no, because I I'm in the lucky position that I get to chat to him every Monday afternoon. I'm sure it's a joy for him. Um, for me, I'm going to hold my questions to after Wendy's um, presentation. Excellent, fine. Thank you very much. Um, have I covered everybody? Uh, Chief Exec, anything you wanted to ask? Or, or make You're a comment. Mute. Oh yeah, there now, Chief. Yeah. <laughs> I was too quick for the mute button. Um, I think the only comment I wanted to make uh, uh, based on what Council Peace has just said is, is we have, a, as you'll appreciate as an organisation, and I'm sure Wendy will touch on it, introduced um, our COVID support officers to support the environmental health teams. We've used COVID ambassadors to get the messages out and spread the messages far and wide about, you know, hands face space and how important it is to for people to stay apart. Um, but I think the message that, that I've been given and would want to reiterate, I think, is that the organisations are not going to resolve this problem uh, and this pandemic. People will resolve the pandemic. Uh, and whilst we still have the vaccination coming, it is still about our own individual behaviours and personal responsibility that will make the biggest difference and will help us get control of the rates of cases on the island in the fastest possible way. So uh, all of our messaging that Wendy will talk about in a moment will be to be encouraging people to uh, to follow all the rules and all the guidelines stay at home from when they can, but also accepting that people do have to go out to work because we have to keep people safe in other ways, not just from mm. COVID, 
but it, it's the winter season. It's the worst time of the season for the hospital, which they're always going to be their worst period anyway. Uh, and we have to protect and look after our most vulnerable from the ordinary winter pressures and problems that they have to deal with. I, I don't want to add any more than that at this moment in time, uh, Leader, but grateful for the chance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also in our chat, um, and I'm grateful to the other members that are uh, uh, monitoring the board. Um, we've had examples of the police um, taping off certain areas to protect and make safe. And then we have members of the Isle of Wight public just ignoring that that uh, arrangement and just carrying on. And I think the big message, as you say, one, stay at home, two, don't mix if you don't have to. Um, and that way we can get ourselves to a place where the vaccinations can kick in and we can ease out of this um, very, very serious case. But I think there are very few people on the Isle of Wight now who don't know somebody that's caught COVID. And there are some people who need to know people that have died on the Isle of Wight. So we can't be strong enough on that message. Um, mm -hmm. I can also say, because I've just come off of a meeting, a national meeting that uh, around the country, they're very aware of all the figures that Simon is uh, showing on the island. Uh, and they are following with interest how we deal with things on the island. So um, this is a big picture that we're part of. So thank you all for that. Um, yeah. Right, Simon, uh, have I covered everybody? Sorry. I just to oh, well, you, you have, Leader, but, but one of the things that whilst we're talking about vaccinations, um, one of the questions that occurs to me is that uh, obviously we had that very first spike in, in March last year. So we've had many, many months of the very first people having uh, COVID. And I've seen suggestions that uh, immunity might only last five or six months, um, which is clearly a real worry if that is the case. And I'm just wondering if Simon has any data that would suggest that it is that short or whether we, we've got data that might be more reassuring. Uh, Leader, shall I pick that up and then carry on with some of the interventions that we're pushing uh, in place? Yes, yes, that will be an ideal lead in. Thank you, Mr Hutchinson. And over to you, Simon. Many, many thanks. So, um, uh, 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 Wendy and I, sorry, the Assistant Chief Executive and I work very closely because actually a lot of the interventions require communication. So it's kind of a, a double act. But if I talk through some of the things we are doing and Wendy will talk through the messages and I'll, I'll pick up Councillor Hutchinson's uh, points around uh, as I talk about the vaccine in a broad sense. So with regard to activities we're undertaking as a health protection board and as a council and partners, we are managing a number of outbreaks in different settings, whether that be in care homes, um, individuals, uh, maybe not outbreaks in schools, but situations in schools. So we're supporting all those settings to further manage um, preventing spread of infection, because that's what we need to do. We do know with uh, communicable disease such as um, COVID that we need to uh, manage that carefully, do a lot of work with colleagues and we're working very well as a system to prevent spread in those settings, whether that's as, to say, a school or a care home or another setting. Uh, with regards to uh, testing, it's worth saying there's a new lots of things going on with testing. Uh, we have developed and um, brought over a local mobile testing unit, uh, which is now at um, the, uh, the leisure centre uh, car park and that is to enable us to ensure that we have a right amount of testing for the island. As you said, Leader, we've had an increase in cases and what we didn't want to happen was that actually people couldn't get tested who needed it. So we, we preempted that and brought that over and that's been really successful, open seven days a week. Um, and that's really yeah. been helpful. Furthermore, you'll have heard on the news around the announcement of community testing, uh, which is a large scale problem. And when this is available to all local authorities now, it wasn't previously, so we weren't able to develop our programme. We are developing a programme with colleagues uh, to look at community testing over for a six week period. It takes a bit of time to develop uh, and we've been doing that and we are working closely with uh, Department of Health and Social Care and they provide military planners to help us. And we will look at how we do that to ensure that, um, as the government also announced, our front facing workers can be tested. Uh, again, little clarity from government what that means, but we are working to make sure that those people who um, are required to go out to work um, can get tested. It's going to be, we're setting that up. It's also worth uh, noting for the board that there are a number of national testing programmes that come down alongside this. So we know there's been an announcement there'll be testing for uh, police and fire colleagues. That's not part of our arrangement, but we need to work closely. So we're developing a number of approaches 
and including working with those adult social care settings that aren't part of the national programme. So we're developing all of that at pace, uh, not only for the island, but working with our colleagues in the NRF. So that's really, really positive news. Uh, but also worth remembering if you have a test and then the lateral flow tests, you do need to get a confirmatory PCR. It's not licensed for you to do it at home at the minute. So we're looking at all of that. And equally, the most important thing people can do, if they've got symptoms, is to isolate. Because actually there's no point in finding out you've got COVID if you then don't do anything about it and how you get your contacts to isolate as well. So we're working through all of that, uh, through an awful lot of the communications that the Assistant Chief Executive has been developing around how to isolate, what you might need to think about, because that's going to be key. I think with regard uh, a couple of other activities that I can just share, with regard to uh, lockdown that we've been in now since um, just just over a couple of weeks, um, that we've been supporting all organisations to understand what that means, uh, both through regulatory services, as Councillor Peace has said, but others, um, you know, how do we really help people understand what that guidance means? And as we've heard that complicated question around schools and that changed quite rapidly. So what do we do there? So an awful lot of work going on there, both in uh, reviewing uh, the guidance, but also listening to what's coming down and working with our supermarkets and other places to really help them embed the behaviours that they need within their own organisations. But if it's a shop, customers. And um, we're, we're hearing news from government about uh, how that may develop further. So we're working with that. Finally, if I can just pick up on the vaccination and pick up on Councillor Hutchinson point. The vaccination in this first phase, so for the vulnerable people of, uh, I think, over 80s health and social care staff, is to um, prevent death and protect health and social care staff in the system. So that's what it's about, and that's why we're doing that vaccination. You'll see the vaccination programme has changed because it, used, it was two doses, and there still is two doses, but they're further apart now to so that we can rapidly roll out as much immunity in our population as possible. So the first dose doesn't give full immunity, but it gives something. So how do we work together? And as Councillor Hutchinson said, we know that some people have had the disease and the information came out on the news this morning. So uh, that actually, if you've had the disease, immunity lasts for some people around six months. Which is right, it's really important that we vaccinate people even if they had the disease, because we know they won't have long-term immunity. It's great they get some immunity, but this virus is going to be around for a little bit longer than six months. So we need to make sure that people do get vaccinated uh, as well to give them fuller immunity going forward. So I think it's really exciting we've got the vaccination programme. It's brilliant that we've got the Oxford vaccine that doesn't require these very low temperatures, and makes it much easier to roll out in our community. It's an NHS led programme, but as a council and as a public health authority, we've got really good experience about working with those vulnerable clients who may not normally access um, vaccination programmes and screening programmes. So we're working to ensure that this vaccination programme meets the needs of our population on the island, working with the NHS colleagues who are providing the actual logistics and medicine to roll that out. So, as I said, it's really encouraging, but we've got a long way to go. Uh, Councillor Stewart, I'll stop there and as always happy to take any questions or it may be better to wait till after. You've wait gone till after Deputy Chief Executive. Um, I, I will do it. Just I want to raise something we actually Councillor Mosdall um, pragmatically came up with, which I thought was a good point. We talk about the importance of people isolating. Um, she has some personal experience of this and and, and, it, and the practical challenges that present. So Claire, I don't know if you just want to mention some of your suggested help and link this to the um, council website where we know there is um, some advice. Yeah, so I, I think as cabinet member for public health, I wasn't expecting to have so much real life experience really of one to what you need to do when you self isolate. Um, I had to self isolate for two weeks. Um, I found it really difficult because I wasn't really prepared for that. Um, I didn't realise that you couldn't even go out and walk your dog. Um, so quite early on after we were talking about having a buddying system. So you make sure that you've already got that contact in place. If you are contacted now to say you have to self isolate, are you ready? Are you really prepared for it? Do you have someone that can do your shopping for you? Do you have someone that if you have animals can help look after them? Um, as you know, um, my mum, my daughter and my granddaughter have all had COVID. Um, so 
what it was it has been really difficult um thankfully my mum is now on the mend my daughter and granddaughter are still having to self-isolate but suddenly we were in a situation where my daughter lives in a property with my granddaughter my mum lives in another property um, and I have been told by test and trace because I have been near them I had to self-isolate for I was at that point eight days so suddenly we didn't have anybody who's going to rush around and get their shopping etc and I also have my mum who was as everybody knows has been really really poorly um, there's lots of things you can do if you are self-isolating you have a poorly el elderly relative um, oxygen finger monitors are now my um, my new best friend um, I never knew that if your oxygen drops below 92 that's your point to call the ambulance um, I've learned a lot about copper soups copper soups are really good to have in your house because they are full of salts um, and when you have got that part of COVID where you have no appetite and sickness and diarrhea, that's really good. You know, it's got a little bit of flavour, but it has those salts as well. And everybody now should have a decent thermometer in their house. You know, my thermometer I had actually hadn't been used since my children were young. Um, and there is no point in having something you can stick on the head when you're dealing with an elderly relative when really they need something within their home. Um, it is really, really difficult and um, I would just like personally to thank my cabinet team because we meet twice a week and I think well, I'm, that they've kept me sane really um, amongst all of this but it's really difficult and it just is made so much easier if you are prepared for it um, and you have to not be afraid. Fear has been my worst enemy since over the Christmas period when mum and Charlotte and Esme all became ill um, I have to say some days I really thought my mum wasn't going to make it but she has um, we have to remember that yes we are in a global pandemic and this is really difficult but try to talk to people share your experience don't be afraid we will get through this but everybody needs that support and nobody should have to do it on their own thank you uh, yes so um thank you for sharing that because i think there's a really clear message and if people go onto the other council website you'll find there's an isolation toolkit as we describe it to use um, two other points came out of my meeting at the local government today um, they are looking to review gambling regulations and they're particularly concerned around online gambling which is increased since people are staying home and the mental pressures that that's reflecting and the other one which is a separate piece of work is the increase in domestic abuse and I would encourage uh, all people who may feel that they are suffering a greater level of domestic abuse or even current level of domestic abuse to use the channels that we talk about to get that support and help. And I'm sure Councillor Peach would echo that. OK, so that brings us up to stage on that. Um, we covered Simon, have we completed? I think we have, in which case we'll go to Wendy Prayer and, com and Communications. Wendy, if you're there. Yes, thanks, Leader. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me now. Yes. Um, I struggled to get my microphone on there for a second. Um, so just a, a very brief update in terms of the activity with regard to communications and engagement. Um, there continues to be considerable activity in relation to communications and engagement. And this, as you will all be aware, has been the case since the start of the pandemic. And that has included providing information, advice and guidance externally to our community and internally to our own staff. In addition to that, we continue to provide bespoke advice and guidance to businesses and stakeholders through the work of our regulatory services and other services within the Council. Not least of which our commissioning services that work with our care provider market on Ireland, who I know have a very strong and good working relationship in terms of providing advice and support to that sector of the market. Our regulatory services, environmental health officers and COVID support officers have been visiting businesses and providing advice and guidance. And we've already discussed today how good the partnership working between this team and the police has progressed, um, culminating in uh, the issue that was mentioned by Councillor Police during our debate earlier. Communication and engagement activity occurs across a range of channels that the Council has available to it and also where appropriate we continue to work with partner agencies to support communications, in particular our partners within the NHS Trust, the CCG and police across the island. 
Our approach as a council has been one of providing factual content and updated information linked to government announcements and supplemented with more emotive content about the impact that COVID is having on the island. I think what we've just seen from Councillor Mosdale is a very good example of um, being able to describe and explain personal experience and the impact that has on families and individuals. And we will be developing this approach over the next two to three weeks. A conversation that I was having with a colleague earlier this week kind of really made me think about um, the personal impact of COVID on our community. Because normally when the council is responding in an emergency situation, it's responding over a very short period of time in a, in a very distinct way, whether that be through snow or um, an issue with a road collapse. This time round, we have a pandemic which has been ongoing for a considerable amount of time. And it's not only impacting our community, but it is impacting all of us, our staff and all members. We are all part of this. And that is a very different scenario from what we normally experience during an emergency situation. And that is why I think that our messaging and our ongoing messaging is really important for our community. Currently, we have a single clear message, which is stay at home and only undertake essential journeys. If we are out and about, we do have to go out, then hands face space is behaviour that we all have to undertake. And I cannot stress how important the issue of making space for one another is. We read all too often um, in the comments on social media and in media about how concerned and how, well, I'll use the word, fearful people are of uh, getting too close to people when they are out and about. So thinking about one another when we are having to go out to do things is a really important part of what we do. And I know that that is a really hard message to hear and that people are weary of COVID, but this really does remain the most critical message that we need to make. Our chief executive um, has already outlined uh, today that it's not organisations that will bring us through this pandemic. It is about us and our behaviours as individuals. We are the front line of the pandemic and what we do to protect ourselves and help us protect others will help our colleagues in our NHS who are under pressure in terms of dealing with the impact of the pandemic. Um, because then they can, then we can ensure that what they can continue to do is to provide, provide services to those that are most in need. In addition to that really strong message about staying at home, we continue to, pro to provide information on uh, availability of our helpline, community support and the really good work that is being undertaken in the communities in terms of local community hubs and volunteers providing to support to, support to individuals. Access to testing. Um, our D Director of Public Health has already outlined that we've increased access to testing recently. So it's really important that we continue to provide that message that if anybody has any symptoms, however um, low level they may feel that is, it is important to self-isolate and get a test. Our business grant process and availability went um, live earlier this week yep. and uh, we have already had a huge response to that in terms of applications for business grants. We continue to provide advice and guidance to signpost mental health support services, domestic abuse support services and we promote online activities that individuals can access. We've also already discussed today our self-isolation toolkit and we are developing uh, if you like a kind of toolbox for self-isolation, things that you might like to have in your cupboard or have available to you at home so that if the worst comes to the worst and you do contract COVID, you can get some low level support for yourself at home by being prepared. I think that's the, the summary of where we are with communications and engagement, but um, given the activity that we are undertaking, I would ask the board to raise any issues of local concern that they are aware of that we may also need to consider in our communications and engagement approach. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'll go around and seek questions. I'll start with Claire because I saw her hand go first. Uh, Claire. So, um, 
the chief executive knows what I'm going to say because I ring him up and I vent on this quite often. Um, there is frustration within the, the, um, the community that we do have several businesses that have to stay open at the moment who are providing services who technically are not classed as key workers. Um, I read um, some of my friends who they are at home furloughed but their husbands have to go out and work in um, in different manufacturing areas. Um, I know some of the businesses that, that we have on the island that are stayed open and still manufacturing are doing essential um, work to keep different parts of, you know, the world open. You know, I, I'd quite happily mention, you know, one of our councillors is one of the directors of Micronair and the work they're doing is absolutely essential for the locust famine in Africa. So everything needs to be done to protect those workers. We're very, we're very good at our key messages of you have to stay at home and work from home. But there seems to be this this sort of ignoring those people that still have to go out to work. And, you know, and so I you know my husband, we don't even share a surname, bless him, but his life's really difficult at the moment, not just because he's married to me, um, but because he has to go out to work. He's an electrician um, we do on calls. Um, so we are never going to leave a little old lady sat in our house with no electric. And I know friends of ours who are plumbers who are not going to leave people without their heating on. Um, it feels at the moment that there's this huge message that you have to stay at work, unless you, but we seem to have forgotten that extra bit unless you have to go out to work um, and I know that need, more needs to be done to protect those people who are having to go out and do a hard day's work within the community it's it's it feels like Russian roulette um, I'm, everyone, I'm not a huggy person anyway and I'm probably taking advantage of it when my husband goes in and go undress on the doorstep put your stuff in the washing machine get up in the shower and know you're not having a hug um, but it is those real complex things about people who are still having to go out to work and I want to see more done to protect those people you know my husband on Sunday had four call outs that was four households he had to go in yes he is exceptionally careful but it, it seems to be there's not much being done to protect those. And John is probably giving a wry smile because we had this conversation about <laughs> 10 minutes before this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, uh, I've got a couple of comments to make. I'll, I'll save them for the moment. Uh, Gary, is there anything else you want to add to that? No, Stuart? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's just one point, Leader. Uh, and this is uh, to do with communication. I mean, obviously, what we're saying to people uh, is the standard um, hands face space and and lots of people have a different idea of quite what space means which is a bit difficult to get across and we have to keep plugging that message but given that there are a number of ways of limiting the potential exposure one of which is masks which we um, are, are making sure that people wear and I'm delighted to see that some of the supermarkets are now uh, actually more vigorously enforcing that. But um, I, I do have a query, and this is one I think for Simon. Um, there's been a lot of uh, advertising around nasal sprays, which are supposedly uh, over 90% efficient in, in coating the nasal passages uh, which also coats the virus and that stops it from getting into your lungs and apparently also stops anything you inhale um, from infecting other people because the virus is wrapped in this in this spray um, and there are a number of different varieties of it uh, now I haven't seen uh, the NHS or public health make any comment about whether this is valuable or not valuable or and I wondered if you had any information or, or a view upon it. Thank you Kat Anderson. I, I've not seen anything about the spray. I think we need to be really careful. We know this virus spreads through droplets from our mouth and our nose uh, so mm. actually we need to uh, prevent spread by stopping that transmission through to other people. So um, yeah. Public Health England look at the evidence uh, on a very regular basis on what will prevent spread. They have mm -hmm. recently looked at that in light of the new variant and we are very clear with College of Public Health England it is around and I'm just going to turn around face so actually it's about what's coming out of our mouths and noses. It's about yeah. hands, let's wash our hands, let's not touch our face and wearing a mask. 
Uh, and then the other thing that we've talked about is ventilate. So how do we make sure that when we're indoors that we ventilate? Yeah. And I'm sure those, if we can do that, that's how we prevent the virus. And I think there are a lot of things you say on the market that people say will make a difference. Please don't uh, buy those unless they're recommended. And we're not recommending any of those. Uh, it's around hand space space, or as I said, face hand space. Yeah, thanks for that clarity. OK, um, I just kind of point to want to make. Um, first of all, and then this will lead into um, the comms arrangements. Um, first of all, uh, I raise a number of issues around the ferries and our lifeline services. And I know there's ongoing work um, being undertaken by officers, which we hope will come to a successful conclusion because we do appreciate how important our ferries are to the island. In addition, um, I have a meeting due shortly with the ferry companies and the police, because as we come out of this lockdown situation, we want to make sure we're again doing everything we can to come out of that safely. Um, I also want to thank, um, uh, and put a bit of thanks out for the wider community beyond the Isle of Wight. Um, we have really have had some good offers of support. I know the, some of the public will have seen the Chinook helicopter um, latest sort of news. Actually, that was organised back in April, and I'm grateful to the NHS for that. Um, we've had offers of aircraft, we've had offers of airport access, we've had all sorts of offers to the island. So sometimes we forget that those beyond the shores of the island do care about us. And uh, again, today I was asked a great deal about how things were and, and how the island was coping. So I think that's important to mention. Um, I'll also mention uh, the helpline 823600 because I always say that's a default position, but we do not want any of our islanders not to feel they can turn for support in whatever form. Um, and on that score, I do absolutely want to thank our council staff and our partners um, in relation to the whole media issue. And I will list it. Um, Isle of Wight Radio, tremendous support. Vectus Radio for the community, the county press on the white island echo, the BBC, the ITV, um, other outlets, um, and even social media, people have sought not to make political gain on this. They have sought to get the messages out that we repeat. And I would just say thank you to them for the e excellent work they've been doing with us to do that. And I hope that's going to prove to be beneficial. Um, is there anything else I need to cover, Wendy, on media and communication? I know we have a briefing at two o'clock with some media, so checking if there's anything missed. Uh, nothing else from my perspective, Chair. Thank you. OK, uh, John, do you have anything else to add? You're nodding yes, but not speaking. Thank you, Chair. I was uh, unmuting. Uh, OK, sorry. <laughs> I, I did just want to um, follow up Councillor Mosdell's point, actually, because I think it, it is really important and um, something that, that we do forget. And I, I think I might have alluded to it earlier that whilst our message is very much that the best thing for everyone to do is to stay home, we do have to recognise and there are some people uh, as she's described, who who are key to keeping everybody going and protecting us from all of the other uh, dangers that, w that might befall us at winter. And uh, as we know, the hospital, uh, especially, uh, and the primary care and the GPs do come under significant pressure at winter without COVID. So, uh, so from our perspective, I think we all we do have to recognise that as a community and try and support those people in the best possible way. And then if they are coming into our homes or into our houses, uh, we have to just really look at the rules for how we can best help them as well. I know that uh, the work that Simon's doing to do to to get a proposal together for a community testing using the lateral flow tests should help us to uh, improve that position. Um, but our challenge, I think we have to be very clear, is it's good, it may take us some time to be able to draw down the lateral flow tests from the government supplies. Um, we have to put a bid together, we have to get that ready to go as quickly as we possibly can, but we are working that as our next area of priority. I think as Simon described, our priority last week was can we get an extra mobile testing unit in so we've got more capacity to do the the PCR or the gold standard tests. Uh, now it's about what to what extent can we get the lateral flow tests in and as quickly as possible and gear ourselves up. We know that it's going to need a substantial effort in terms of staff to resource that approach uh, and we have to look from within the staff cohorts that we have and uh, I know from uh, contacts with, with, with colleagues you know, uh, as well as uh, and Wendy said this a little bit herself as well so as well as all of our staff uh, working to respond to the crisis they're already they're part of the the crisis as well and 
we do know that many are self-isolating and many have, uh, have contracted COVID. So that does, uh, to some extent, reduce our ability to respond uh, at all at most times. Although we are prioritising all of our activities to make sure that we've got staff staff in the right place at the right time. So I think it's just a, a plea that uh, to, to recognise the point that, that uh, Councillor Mosdell raised. Uh, but also, I think that uh, the, the next stage is the, the lateral flow testing, and that's something that we are working really hard to secure. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chair, can I just make a comment? Yes. Um, it, it's something that's, that's come to mind, and it's it's uh, very much a local issue. I've heard very recently in my local ward air of Ventnor um, of people disregarding the fact that they have COVID, and they're stood in, for, for example, one example is that uh, there was a person stood in a chemist queue um, who admitted to everybody they had COVID at the time. Um, and, and that points to, to two things. It's a complete disregard for the safety of everybody else, um, but it's verging on stupidity. Um, and I think that's, that, that's a strong word, but you're putting people's lives at risk if you knowingly have COVID and you are going out and about. Um, and I think one of those messages we have to reinforce alongside um, you know, the fact we need uh, emergency workers out and about, um, and we need lateral flow tests and all that kind of stuff, is that if you have COVID and you know you've got COVID, you do not go outside. Two cases locally uh, where people have ignored that advice and that guidance, and I know that it's happening elsewhere on, along, uh, around the island. So I think that is one real message. If you've got it, you do not go out, and some people don't seem to realise that that's what the rules are. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Gary. I think it's a very, very appropriate point. Uh, OK, um, the last item on the agenda is members questions. I don't have any specific members questions that came in um, by the deadline. So if members do have questions who are listening in, um, as all we, we meet internally regularly and we're happy to deal with any questions with members anyway. Um, the only thing I don't have, and I'm going to look to Jane for this now, is just to confirm the next public meeting date and time. I know as a, a board we meet regularly and weekly um, internally, but I just wanted for those that might be listening to be able to give them that. Um, Jane, do you have that date? If you just bear with me, I'll uh, I'll get that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then to the media that may be listening, we have a meeting with you at two o'clock today when we'll give you all the information we can do and take any questions from you. And then for the board, um, perhaps we can meet um, about uh, just after one today just to uh, walk through all the information that we want to make available, if that's OK. I think we've got a book time made. Um, any OK, uh, other than that, I don't have anything else for the meeting agenda today. So other than confirming the time of the next meeting, I shall then close the meeting. Just wait for Jane to do that. I think it's yes, the 11th, it's the of February. 11th of February. Yeah, so 11th of February. Do we have a time? I was anticipating it may be similar to now, but certainly a meeting yeah. will be on the 11th of February and members of the public will be able to go on the council website to get full details. So on that basis, thank you everybody for attending the meeting today. Um, see you for the media pre-brief and uh, carry on working as hard as you are. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Lida. Thank you, Lida.